it isn't all that newsworthy now. This is the sad reality to point out examples of really, and quite frankly, Orwellian goings on on campuses. Now, a lot of the time, the tendency towards embracing censorship on university and college campuses is coming about through mobs, groups of protesters, rioters, demonstrators, student unions. This one is unique, although by no means completely isolated, because it's actually the school's administration that seems to be allowing these problems to prosper here. And it takes place at Wilfrid Laurier University, where a graduate student used a clip from TVO's The Agenda with Steve Pakin, a very popular episode and widely circulated episode that included controversial University of Toronto professor Jordan Peterson in it. The grad student used this in the context of a presentation she was giving. And she was doing this in teaching a tutorial to some of the first-year students enrolled in a communication studies class. So she used this to spark a debate about styles of communication, including gender pronouns. Now, obviously, that is a debate that is poignant, and no matter which side you find yourself on, I would hope that you'd agree that it's something that should be openly discussed, as most, if not all, issues should be. But instead, there was a complaint she was told by two professors and an official from the university's diversity and equity office that she was transphobic for doing this, that she created, quote, a toxic climate, unquote, and... She was censored, basically, and that's just reprehensible. I want to bring into the show David Millard Haskell, a professor from Wilfrid Laurier University and also one who wrote an op-ed about this in the Toronto Star. Professor, good to talk to you again. Thank you for joining me today. Yeah, thanks, Andrew, for having me on. I appreciate it. You know, there's an incredibly concerning undertone to this overtone, actually, I'd say, because we're not just talking about a a demonstration to counter protest, which is, is problematic, but we're talking about a group that has invested and entrusted authority that is saying to this grad student, who also has a position of leadership to some extent, you are not allowed to to have debates, but 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 especially when you look at how relatively benign what she was demonstrating was, something that was suitable for public access television, but not for classroom discussion. Yeah, that's correct. Well, what this has done is it's pulled back the curtain on the great and uh, powerful Oz. And by that, I mean that we are beginning to see through these kinds of examples what actually gets taught and the mindset of some of these professors, and it's Mm -hmm. very problematic. So here we have a grad student who was uh, very judiciously uh, showing two sides of an argument, but she was explicitly told, you cannot show that other side of the argument. And that is what is happening in many of our university programs. And, and it is excluding, our, it's, a, it's stopping our, our young people from getting a diversity of ideas. And that's problematic because then they're not going to learn how to critically think. You know, I've known of professors who, and it obviously depends on the field of study and the makeup of the class, but they'll show pornography in class for a, a particular purpose, or they'll show something very graphic, or maybe there's really profane language or whatnot. And, and even this, I, I think there's a place for it in an academic setting, but we're not even talking about someone here who who made a, a comment that was offensive, or someone who showed material that was profane or, or something like that. The the big point, and I, I'm glad you shared this, is that it's the idea itself that was deemed to be a foul of the rules. The idea itself, and that's terrifying. It, it really is, and I think that it it just goes to show what passes for uh, academic integrity or what passes for academic mindset. Now, I don't want to paint every academic with the same brush, obviously, but we really do have a problem in our universities right now, and I see it myself at faculty meetings and in talking with certain colleagues, that they believe that censorship is legitimate. And they believe that as long as I have the right ideas, then you can say them. And the the right ideas typically are uh, leftist ideas, and I'm talking regressive leftist Mm -hmm. ideas, what we would call extreme left ideas. And as long as you have those, you you can speak out. But if you don't, well, then as a public good, they must silence you. And we see this here. I mean, the, uh, the young lady's professor said in showing this video, which had been already shown to hundreds of thousands of people on TV Ontario, uh, in showing, he said, this is like showing a speech by Hitler, yeah. right? Uh, and promoting a speech by Hitler is more so. Wow. Well, well that, 
that's just absolutely nonsense. But this is what happens. You see, rather than build an argument on facts, you create these extreme labels to shut down your opponents. You're writing about this in a public platform, obviously, the Toronto Star, but as a professor at that school, what message does this send to you and your colleagues? Well, for many, uh, I don't know, for a few, it's probably troubling. I think that uh, it hasn't come out, but I was talking with Lindsay today, the grad student Mm -hmm. who has uh, suffered this injustice, and I said, so how many professors have come to support you, have reached out via email or call? And by today's count, it's four. Now, keep in mind that 550 full-time professors are employed at Wilfrid Laurier University, and four have reached out to this grad student who, who did her job well. And this, to me, is a sign of terrible things to come, because either my colleagues are cowards or they're complicit in this mentality. Now, her thesis advisor has said in this meeting, and and parts of it were recorded, that uh, discussions like this are not up for debate. Now, I can think of a great many academic uh, conclusions that challenged orthodoxies, that challenged uh, the status quo of the day, and have become now the status quo of today. So to say that anything is not up for debate is, I think, something that people should find is problematic. But also, knowing that this is coming from her thesis advisor, we're talking about someone whose academic career career is threatened, it seems like, if she happens to not believe the right thing. Uh, that's right. For, just a point of clarification, it is her course advisor. I was talking to Lindsay today, and it's her course advisor. Um, but to your point, his, he was saying that this is not up for debate. Well, I've heard that before, and it's typically used by people who can't make an argument that would <laughs> defeat the other side. And, and it's so much easier to say this isn't up for debate than to actually engage in debate, especially when you don't have the evidence. Related to evidence, I'm, I'm really growing tired and frustrated of my colleagues saying that this particular I- idea makes um, our mm-hmm. classroom unsafe. This idea of an unsafe idea is rubbish. It, it, is, it is not backed up empirically. In my piece in the Star, I'm only able to, to mention it briefly, but the empirical evidence shows that under normal circumstances, when one is exposed to an objectionable idea, it does no psychological harm. But my colleagues are using this, this excuse that it does psychological harm, to bully and censor those with whom they disagree. And we've got to, we've got to start calling BS on this. We've got to start saying, listen, every time you say that this causes harm in order to stifle somebody else, it is a lie. Uh, apart from those cases where someone actually is suffering from post-traumatic stress syndrome, where, where certainly uh, um, even a, a something typical in everyday life, an objectionable idea could perhaps trigger them. Other than that, in normal, in normal everyday uh, student in a classroom, they should be exposed to every idea because the other part of the literature is that it shows that in by being exposed to a diversity of ideas, even those that you're opposed to, it actually makes yeah. you mentally stronger. Let me ask you then why there isn't a stronger protection of academic freedom for, for students, because we know that tenured professors enjoy academic freedom, although I think people could probably debate whether or not that's enforced in, in reality today. But has there ever been a concerted effort to protect that for students? Not yet, and it's getting worse. Uh, we, we have just passed a few policies at Wilfrid Laurier <clears throat> that... Um, actually tighten the noose on free expression. Um, and uh, I, we don't have time to get into those today, but it's part of a larger package of, of just censorship that uh, is rampant both at my university and at others. I, I, again, we don't have time today, but this is not unusual. I mean, you may have talked with your listeners about the incident earlier in this year at Ryerson, where a student wanted to uh, simply do an essay on the gender wage gap. She was a business student at Ryerson taking a sociology course. She said to a professor, I want to do uh, an essay on the gender wage gap, but I want to bring in stats from Statistics Canada, and I want to bring in business reports from business journals. The professor at Ryerson, a sociology professor, said, you cannot do that. You can only use the feminist sources that I have given you. And then she summed up her email, which again is on record, and she said, don't you know the patriarchy is real? Wow. 
this is the level. This is the new authority. This is what they're deferring to. I don't even think academic freedom is that desirable an idea for the people that succumb to this way of thinking. Well, it's not. And any time you have a totalitarian regime, they are loath to give up control. So if it was the Catholic Church, then they would call someone a heretic and they'd burn you at the stake. But what is happening right now with the regressive left in academia, their ploy is let's call that unsafe and then we'll say you can't say that because it will cause harm. But it's the same result. They want to ensure that they keep power, that the opposing views don't come forth. And here's the thing. I want a diversity of ideas, just like I want a diversity of of the population at my university, because it's in a diversity of ideas that we actually are able to overcome our differences. We stick with words and we don't go to war. Who has the power to make these changes? Is this coming from faculty associations? Is this coming from administration? Is the student union playing a role? Who is the one that can actually cause these things to start going the way that you and I, I think, would both agree is important? At some universities, at about 30 universities in the U.S., the faculty have led a charge for freedom of speech, freedom of expression. And it's been articulated in what's been known as the modeled Chicago Statement. So the Chicago Statement was first put out by the University of Chicago, and it said no matter how undesirable the idea, no matter how repugnant to some, we are still going to allow these ideas to be aired on our campus. Then another uh, 30 universities in the U.S. have said, yes, we will adopt this Chicago Statement on maximum freedom of expression. So far, no one in Canada has adopted this. And your question was, Well, how would it be adopted? Would it be administration? Would it be professors? Well, at these other schools, it was a combination of administration and professors putting it forward. But let's look at this. 550 professors at Wilfrid Laurier, of which four reached out to a grad student. Mm -hmm. What are the chances that these professors are going to support uh, a freedom of expression statement that, uh, that would really... It would have supported the same ideas that Lindsay has been trying to, uh, to stand for. So I'm not hopeful that way. What could be done is alumni from Wilfrid Laurier could wake up and say, this is devaluing my degree. This is, this is really problematic because people are going to associate my degree with this, with this scandal. So I think alumni should take action. I think that parents should say, am I really prepared to send my child to a place where education has been exchanged for indoctrination. And lastly, I think that the governments who are supporting universities need to say, we believe that freedom of expression is so important that we will tie it to funding, which we did see in the liberal, or I'm sorry, in the conservative campaign, but we've not heard anything about that since. So I don't think it's going to happen within my university or most Canadian universities, but hopefully alumni, parents, and maybe government could get involved. Well, and I'm glad it's not just about hand-wringing. There are actually things that could offer a better way forward. So I appreciate you sharing those. Professor David Millard Haskell, author of a great piece in the Toronto Star, suppressing TVO video, stifling free speech, is making Wilfrid Laurier unsafe. David, good to talk to you again. Thanks for coming on, as always. My pleasure. All right, thank you.